Guys, before we go any further, though, I want you to stop. Trust me, just pause what you're doing and go to solelyrested.com slash flower. S-O-U-L-Y rested.com slash F-L-O-U-R. Really do it. I'll be here. I'll be waiting when you get back. But the reason I want you to go there is there is a new grain mill available on the market that has blown me away. It is available at a price point that you will find nowhere else. And it makes the finest, most amazing fresh flour. Fresh flour contains 40 out of the 44 essential nutrients that your body needs. Using fresh flour will up the game in your kitchen. And it even can help you lose weight because it makes you feel more full. It avoids the blood sugar spikes and it even helps with inflammation. There's so many reasons, guys, to switch over your flour to fresh flour that you have ground yourself. And with this new mill, everybody can do this. I'm not kidding. Go check it out. I even have an exclusive code for you and it gets even crazier. I'm giving one of these mills away. If you're listening to this right after it has been published only for another day or two, go check it out. Go to that page and you'll find the giveaway there where you can enter to win one of these for free. Solelyrested.com slash flower. Don't miss this, guys. Hi, guys. Welcome to the Simple Doesn't Mean Easy podcast. We are here every week working at simplifying things in our lives one day at a time, one simple step at a time. I'm your host, Michelle Visser. And today I got to sit down and talk with someone who's actually been on the podcast before. And I enjoyed it so much the first time. I knew I was going to love this conversation today. And after I got done, I actually had a few things I had to do. And then a daughter asked if I wanted to go on a bike ride. And it is a gorgeous, gorgeous fall day here in New England on the day that I'm recording this. So I dare, I wouldn't even consider saying no to that, a gorgeous bike ride. So as I'm doing these other things, going to the post office and doing my errands and riding the bike, and I'm thinking about my talk today with Daryl. I should tell you, I I spoke with Daryl Bosshart, who is the, um, truly the premier expert on salt. And I, (laughs) I've just been rehashing in my mind and thinking through what we talked about and some of the details that he shared, some of the images and like just a way to literally concretely understand something that just kind of eludes me that I'm kind of, I have trouble describing sometimes. Like I know these facts that he was sharing, but when he, Daryl just has a way of giving you this example that makes you go, Oh, okay. I get it. So I really think you're going to love this episode. I, I do want to share with you a couple things. He, near the end, we were talking about iodine because, you know, we have iodized salt when you go to the grocery store and you're looking at all your choices, and there are a lot of them, a lot of those choices have iodine in them. So we get into that and he explains the history behind it. Actually, in his previous episode, which was season seven, episode one, he gets into even more of the history. So if you're a history buff and you want to listen to that, you'll enjoy that episode when you're done this episode, season seven, episode one. Um, But anyway, he's talking about the iodine and he gives this beautiful image that is going to stick with you. Once you hear this, you're not going to forget it. And it's really going to clear things up for you. If you've ever wondered, you know, well, do I have to get the iodized salt? Why is it in there? But he explains that there are certain things in our diet that we should have less of or avoid if we're concerned about an iodine deficiency. And we talk about why that matters too. But I wanted to tell you, because I didn't want to like pause what we were talking about and scoot in this information. So I thought I would just add it here. If you want to know more about two of the things that he mentions, one is avoiding enriched flour. I have a whole resource for you, a free email e-course. If you go to solely rested, S-O-U-L-Y rested.com slash flower, F-L-O-U-R. And you can dive into all the details about fresh flour, how it's different than the enriched flour you buy at the store and why it matters. So definitely, 
If you haven't taken that free resource of a course, please go do so. Solelyrested.com slash flower. And then Daryl mentions fluoride and how that can be a problem if we're having it. Now, he doesn't go into the details, but if we have it in our drinking water, if we have it in our toothpaste, and I wanted to make sure I told you that there is an all natural alternative that is so much better. Fluoride does not naturally occur in our teeth, but hydroxypate does. And I have been using a toothpaste for about a year and a half now that is amazing that has done wonderful thing for my teeth all naturally with zero fluoride. So you're not going to have the problems that Daryl is getting into when it comes to iodine in your diet, because there's also fluoride that's keeping your body from processing the iodine. So get rid of the fluoride. Trust me, you don't need it in your toothpaste. And I've had a dentist on that has talked in depth about that. I'll link that episode in the show notes if you want to know more about that. But go to solelyrested.com slash teeth. T-E-E-T-H, and I link to my favorite products that are amazing for your teeth with zero chemicals, additives, or fluoride. It's only rested.com slash teeth. But let me tell you a little bit more about today's guest. Daryl Bosshart is passionate about healthy living, healthy eating, and lifelong learning. He grew up working for the family mineral business in Redmond, Utah. And then he earned a Bachelor of Science degree at Southern Utah University, followed by an MBA at Western Governors University. And this guy knows salt. I mean, he literally has been around it since he was born. And he also has been around good food since he was born. He talks, we we chat about his mom and some of the wonderful bread she made when he was growing up from fresh flour. So we even get into flour in this episode, but you're going to love this. And now I'm excited to bring on Daryl and really get down to some nitty gritty, amazing details about salt. Daryl is going to be busting three myths and getting the truth ingrained in our mind with wonderful examples that are going to make it crystal clear why these are myths about salt. Maybe they're myths you've heard your whole life and it's going to be fun. So here we go. Well, Daryl, I am truly excited to see you again and to chat again. It was so fun when you were on the show last time. I had to look it up because I never remember the details, but it was season seven, episode one, because I know when folks are done listening to this, they are going to want to go back and listen to that one because so much good stuff there. But thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. It's great to be on. We were just talking before the show started. I think it was about a year ago. Uh, mm-hmm. that we were together. And I'm excited to cover a few myths today about salt and yes. maybe not as in depth as our previous one, but uh, yes. looking forward to the conversation. And some whole different information from the previous one too. In fact, I've learned a lot since the last one. I mean, you taught me a ton a year ago. And since then, I've been learning more and more. And I was eager to pick your brain specifically about one of these myths. I personally am very interested in hearing your answer. Um, but before we dive in, Tell folks, Daryl, a little bit about yourself. I mean, I've already told them that you are a renowned salt expert, but, you know, how does one become such a thing? So salt, if you look it up in the dictionary, it's the kind of the definition of a commodity. Um, but salt is so much more than that. And uh, I'm one of the weird people who just think salt is fascinating. And my grandfather and his brother were kind of the reason that I got into the salt business. Back in the 1950s, they had a farm that wasn't doing too well. Under the farm, there was this ancient mineral salt deposit from the Jurassic era. And so the two brothers, kind of the American dream, right? They go into the salt business and they started selling salt to the farmers, just the locals, and then started selling it to keep the roads dry because salt does melt ice and snow off the roads. And then in the 1970s, Um, When the health food movement started to really take hold is when the family got into the the culinary salt business. And there was a nutritionist that said this salt from Utah is the healthiest, tastiest salt out there. So health food stores wanted to put it on their shelves. And we came up with an idea of what do we call this stuff? It's not half salt. It's not no salt. It's not new salt. It's not. (laughs) It's just real salt. And the brand was born. I love it. I love it. You could have called it really pretty salt because that's what I think of it as. It's gorgeous with all the little colors. It's just, it's like 
jewels almost. Okay, so you said it was like the all-American dream. And I think probably you were talking about the entrepreneur part, not the salt part, right? Because I don't think most people sit around thinking, could I start a, start a salt business today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more of the, uh, the entrepreneurial side of, of uh, small business in America, yes. Absolutely, I love it. And whenever I can find a company that I love and I find out that that is their origins, it gets me so happy because seriously, I mean, this sounds like, I don't know, a slogan for... A politician, but it's what our country is based on, the hard sweat and the family working together. And I love it. And I love the story of your company. I really do. So you, as a kid, I think you once told me, instead of playing in like a sandbox, you were like, right, playing in the salt? What? <laughs> yeah, that's true. I remember as a kid going and uh, I'm going out on a Saturday and driving loader with my dad. That's how I learned to drive was in a big loader. And as kids, we would race up the salt piles um, and, you know, tumble down them like, you you know, you sometimes you, as a kid, you go to the park and roll down the hill and we would go roll down the salt piles. And I remember as a kid, if you have like a little cut on your arm or something and the salt would just sting. And um, but yeah, it was, it was a fun way to grow up. And uh, when I used to joke, you know, when my dad said, if you don't straighten up, I'll send you to the salt mines at my house. That wasn't a joke. <laughs> But it wasn't Except a punishment you didn't mind either. because you got right. to drive. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, so fun oh, way to, love fun it. Way to love grow it. up. Oh, it sounds like it for sure. Um, so actually speaking of your grandfather, my grandfather, actually, I have a story related to salt. Not, not at all the same. <laughs> he, he like had it in his head from so many medical doctors, I'm guessing that he should not eat salt. I'm not exaggerating. He was like an all or nothing kind of person. He tried to completely eliminate salt, like completely, because he was doing it in the name of good health. Now, mind you, now that I'm on the journey I have been for the past decade and learning about real food, learning about processed food, I realize there's no way that he eliminated all the salt because he was getting it in his processed foods that he was eating. But he did eliminate all the extra salt. And it actually really hurt his health. He had a lot of problems that he had to recover from. And the doctors are like, what are you doing? You can't just stop, Maurice. <laughs> you know? So from what I understand, eating less sodium literally forces our body like to save the sodium, right? And that forces our kidneys to do crazy hormonal things, right? And we wind up with a higher blood pressure. Am I right? Like, You are absolutely right. And um, speaking of your grandfather, that makes sense given that age bracket because there was a study, and I can't remember if we talked about this last time, and I'm not sure if you can see this, but -hmm. this study was a 1954 study. And just Mm -hmm. like for a period of time here in the U.S., fat went through this, um, this process where we decided or somebody decided that all fat was bad. So we had all this low fat diet craze. And what we found was people were switching fat for terrible sugars. Um, And our bodies, when it's the right kind of fat, our bodies need fat. Our brains need fat. Our heart, our our bodies have to have good fat, not the bad fat. And there was a study on salt in 1954 that linked copious amounts of processed salt to some adverse health conditions in a subset of the population. And this one study is what kind of uh, shifted to this craze called the low salt diet. And for years it was published and it was the recommended, just like the low fat diet was so recommended. And then when they started doing some follow-up studies, they realized that those that were consuming the lowest amounts of salt actually were having more heart issues than those consuming the highest amounts of salt. And it was because as you point out, our bodies are saline solution in motion. Our tears are salt. Our sweat is salt. Our urine is salt. And even if we drink distilled water, our sweat and our urine and our intercellular fluids will still be salt because our bodies have to have salt to survive. In fact, saline in your eyes there's no sensation. If you get saline in your nasal cavity, there's no sensation. If you pour distilled water in your eyes, um, it's going to make them sticky. It's going to burn. If you were to do the same thing as a nasal rinse, um, because our bodies are saline solution, our, our tears are salt, our sweat is salt. And 
That's interesting because not to interrupt that, you, but I've never thought of that. That's such a good picture for me now. That idea that the saline, saline, I can't talk, Daryl, the saline solution isn't going to even be noticed by our body because it's what our body's made up of. Wow. Yeah. And so the oceans are three times, they're about 3% salt and our bodies are about one. It's actually 0.9. And so the reason that when you go swim in the ocean, it stings your eyes or, you know, burns your nose is because it's three times saltier than our, than our current bodies are. And that's why it hmm. stings where uh, a saline IV, there's no sensation because it is it's balanced and it's what our bodies are made of. Where if you got an IV of distilled water or an IV of tap water or an IV of coffee, as well as that might sound in the morning, those are all going to be disastrous. Uh, it has to be, it has to be saline solution. And so that's the short version of the salt myth that our bodies are made in salt and we need salt to survive. The challenge, as you pointed out with your grandfather, there are a lot of foods because salt is a good preservative, they will use high amounts of processed salt to preserve foods that we shouldn't be eating. And then we, we feel sick, we're bloated, we have water retention issues, but it's not the natural clean salt that's doing that. It's the highly processed foods preserved with the copious amounts of highly processed salt exactly. that leads to some pretty terrible outcomes. But natural yeah. salt, especially if somebody's eating um, a, a more natural diet, they're making food at home, they're planting a garden, they're enjoying fresh produce, you actually have to go out of your way to add good, clean salt to your diet. Now, if you're eating 90% out of boxes and cans, yeah, you're probably getting enough salt to keep you functioning, but it's a highly processed salt in highly processed foods. And and that's a different scenario than, than what most that are eating a more natural diet would find in that they'd have to go out of their way to actually add good, clean salt back, or they would end up in a situation like your grandfather. Absolutely. And I mean, we've just gone down this whole spiral as a country since, I don't know, the, but I know you said this, it was in the fifties you were talking about. I'm thinking around the eighties too. I noticed a lot of, I think that's when the no fat thing really went crazy um, at least that's what I remember when I was growing up as a teenager and, and I was obsessed with it as a teenager that, oh, we can't have fat. And here today, Daryl, I sit as a pig farmer who processes and uses lard daily. So I mean, <laughs> I know I have learned about healthy fats and I have realized the difference in my own personal life. It's insane. So, I mean, you're right. If we stick with the natural and we avoid the refined, whether we're talking sugars, flour or salt, you know, and go with the natural options. The difference is amazing and our body responds accordingly. Well, and in terms of importance, as far as what keeps us alive, we have oxygen, which is obviously if the oxygen were sucked out of this room or the rooms that we're in, we're going to immediately notice that. And the second most important is water. We can live a long time without food. We can live a lot lo a shorter period without water. Mm -hmm. And then the third in order of importance is actually salt. Wow. Um, and, and that's why it was written about in every religious text, why it was so important, why it's given intravenously in every hospital in the world, because it's oxygen and then water and then salt, the right kind of salt. And then I would even put fat right. probably is the next on the list. And what's yeah. interesting, you know, we humans have kind of forgotten um, our cravings. And oftentimes we might think we're craving a big bag of potato chips or a big salty snack. And it's not the snack food, it's actually the salt that our yes. bodies are craving. And if we watch animals, animals are really smart. If you watch the horses, right, they'll, they'll go out and they don't overdose on salt, but they'll mm -hmm. lick the salt lick, then they'll go drink water, then they might chew on this piece of bark over here and eat this grass over here because they're, they're, they're so in tune and listening to their bodies. And I think because we have our fridges that are right there and all of the abundant snacks right at the checkout line, we think we're craving a big candy bar or we think we're craving, you know, French fries or we're thinking or we're craving sugar. But oftentimes those cravings are fat and salt that we're craving. Mm -hmm. And then we convert that into eating junk food when that yeah. good, clean fat and good, clean salt will really satisfy. In fact, at my desk, I, I keep a little dish of salt crystals. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you get snacky, 
you can just put a little piece of salt under your tongue. And it's amazing how satisfying that just one little piece of salt is because mm. oftentimes we're craving water and salt and fat. We're not mm. craving sugar, but we sometimes mistake yeah. that craving for salt as a craving for sugar or sweet. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyone who's listening and not watching, Daryl literally just showed us this gorgeous bowl of, <laughs> what do you call that coarseness of salt? You just... Coarse. It's coarse. <laughs> It's a of really course, hard word, course. Michelle. <laughs> um, so these, this beautiful little chunk of coarse salt that he just popped in his mouth. And it's funny because as you were showing the bowl, I was just about to tell you, well, yes, fat's really important in our diet, but I never would go to my kitchen counter and get my jar of lard that I have sitting by the stove that I use for oil and go, hmm, let me pop a little piece of lard under my tongue. <laughs> so salt wins. Okay. It just does. I admit it. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay. So I will also put in the show notes, cause I've found studies not too distant past. In fact, I put a few of the um, descriptions here in my notes to just share with those listening that I found studies, one of uh, one of which saying that showing that people who eat less than the recommended amount of salt in their diet have a 19% higher risk of dangerous heart related events. And I'm just quoting what I read from the summary of the study, which I found fascinating. So I'll link that. Another one told me, for the general population, there is no significant risk of either immediately developing or worsening any existing heart issues via sodium. And then finally, there's one that researched the impact of sea salt on hypertension and kidney damage in rats, and it found that sea salt had none of that. So all of that I will link in the show notes. Um, and I can send you a couple other ones um, that you can grab. Awesome. One's from the American Journal of Medicine, uh, one from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition that kind of summarizes those same points. Um, I would love that. I'll, because I'll send those over to you. That's awesome. I love it that science has finally gotten to the point that they are not only discovering this, but admitting it. Like, uh, we kind of messed up. <laughs> Guess what, guys? We need salt. It's good for us. Um Okay, so the second myth is the one that I really wanted to pick your brain about because recently um, I was just scrolling through my Instagram and somebody who I don't, I, I don't even know if I follow the person, but apparently a lot of people do, like 400 plus thousand people follow this person who was talking about heavy metals and the toxicity of them in our food and in our life. Um, I did look back in his reel before this, he was talking about lead paint. So, I mean, he covers the whole gamut of, you know, toxic metals. And he was saying that there have been studies recently that show the high toxic levels of metal in certain salts mean you should avoid them. And when he held up my favorite salt, the only salt I have used for six or seven years now, I went, wait a minute, I'm not believing this because I have researched this salt and I know how good it is for me. I will go on to say that I did watch to the end of his reel, and guess what? He was selling a course that will help you eliminate, eliminate toxic metals from your diet. Imagine that. So it kind of works for him. <laughs> but I, that's when I wanted to, that's actually when I reached out to you because I said, okay, I don't know enough about this. I know that what he's saying is a fallacy, but I don't know enough about it, and I know somebody who does. So that's why I called you. So tell me, tell me about this. Is it true? So, I know it's not. <laughs> so, so the short version is actually, yes, in most of the foods we eat, there are trace amounts of heavy metals. Um, because we live on the planet Earth and the Earth is mm -hmm. made up of all the Earth's of, of the elements of the Earth, you know, if we were to go out and harvest from a clean, organic farm some sweet potatoes and we analyze those, there would be trace, trace amounts of heavy metals in those. And that's what this study found. They actually did a study. They tested like 300 salts and they found that 98% of them had some level of all of these trace elements from the earth because they're from the earth. And so yeah. as, as consumers, yes, we need to do our best to find the foods that are, are safe and that are toxic free. But at the same time, unless we're going to go live on you know some other planet, everything that we eat is going to have trace amounts of that. In fact, the FDA does a study every year. It's called a food diet study. And they will, um, I can, you know, there's a little chart of that for those that are on here. But you mm -hmm. can see these different foods that are listed, sweet potatoes and pickles. And, and all of those have 
heavy metals in them. And mm-hmm. so if you have, you know, 0.03 parts per million, and then you eat four ounces, a four ounce serving, you're going to get a few micrograms of lead in natural, clean, healthy produce. And so we do need to go out of our way as consumers to find the cleanest, healthiest food out there. And, mm-hmm. and there's no question as far as that goes. I think the fallacy in, in this particular article, and it was, you know, a sensational news. And, and if you read the article studied, the, the original article said, because all these natural products have trace amounts of metals in them, then the solution is to eat a processed salt. Um, oh my goodness. Are you serious? That was, that was the results <laughs> of their study. Um, and oh. I would postulate or propose that even if you eat an organic piece of produce, that's an a organic potato that mm-hmm. has, you know, 0.02 parts per million of something in it, I would still suggest I would rather eat that than a Franken potato that's manufactured in a lab that is completely processed and very different. hundred um, percent. Now, fortunately, you know, we humans, um, because we live on the planet Earth and all of our ancestors have before us, we can process quite a bit of these heavy metals in our diet because our bodies have been around it since the dawn of time. And so the Mm -hmm. FDA and the the World Health Organization, they have an amount that says if your blood has less than this amount in it, then it's not going to have any impact because our bodies can process that. So in terms of drinking water, for instance, they say, you know, drinking water can have 15 parts per billion lead in it, and it won't have any impact on our body because if we're drinking, you know, let's say if if I'm 150 pounds or 180 pounds and I'm going to drink half my body weight in ounces, I'm going to drink about 75 to 90 ounces of water. And at 15 parts per billion, you convert that into milligrams or micrograms of lead, and it's a small enough amount that our body can process it safely. That amount, according to the FDA and World Health Organization, who I don't trust on everything, but they say (laughs) that safe amount of lead is less than 70 micrograms or 75 micrograms. To put that in context, if you're eating six grams of salt per day, let's, let's cut that number in half. Let's say the FDA World Health Organization says 70 is a safe number. Let's cut that in half and say, let's, let's use 30, which is half of that that amount. Well, in order to well, get I'm cl- not good at math, but wait a minute. That's not, did, did well, you say 60 and 30? Half. Okay, it's, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I'm I trying using... to follow your numbers. I'm trying really hard no, and I'm my saying, brain got <laughs> No, I'm saying 70. Uh, yeah. So 30 would be less than I'm half just teasing you. I'm just teasing um, you. Yep. But with the trace amounts of of lead in natural salts, in order to even get close to that amount, you'd have to eat over 6 tablespoons of salt mm. every single day. Wow. Um, for the rest of your life. And and we're that's just a massive amount of salt. And that's salt. only less than half of what they say is okay. And that's six tablespoons. Correct. Wow. Now to give you a feel for what that would look like in water, if I'm 150 pounds and I am drinking about half my body weight in ounces, so 175 ounces of water, um, I would be getting about 30 micrograms from just drinking that water. So Hmm. yes, we do need to be aware of food in our diet. We do need to go out of our way to have safe, clean foods. And yes, anytime you're eating natural food from a natural source that's coming from the earth, because we live on the earth, you're going to have a trace amount, but focusing on salt. Yes. If it was some super high amount, but we're talking, you know, 0.1 or less parts per million and you're eating six grams of it, you're going to get way more heavy metal toxicity from eating natural kale, natural potatoes, and even, you know, natural meat products than you would with the, you know, half a microgram that you might be getting from salt in your diet. So yes, we need to be aware of it. Yes, every trace or every natural product is going to have trace amounts of the metals from the earth because no surprise, we live on the planet earth. But salt is such a small part of your diet, and it's such a small amount in this natural food. It's not like it's coming from lead-based paint or from some, you know, toxic environmental spill. This is, it's a natural product from the earth, and it's going to have trace amounts of the earth elements. And whether you use Celtic, Himalayan, uh, Hawaiian, any of the natural good salts out there, 
unless you're going to a processed refined salt that's you know been created and manufactured there is going to be trace amounts but it's such a trace amount and it's a, such a small part of your diet that you'll be getting way more from water you'll be getting way more from the food that you're eating and and so focus on those not the you know a few grams of salt that you might be consuming in a day versus the four or five pounds of food or the eight or nine pounds of water. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned kale. And just last night, I loaded up my dehydrators with kale from my garden. And this morning, I processed it all into kale powder. And then I went, actually, actually, I thought of you this morning, Daryl, because I made a smoothie that I, I got the inspiration when I was out in Utah. I can't tell you how much I love your little what do you call it? Not restaurant, little, little farm, oh, farm, farm store, farm store. And you have a, like a cafe there. And what, what city is that in? Uh, so we have one in Hotel. Salt Lake and one in Orem and then one in Heber city. Okay. Salt Lake is where I was. Um, you think I'd remember that that's a pretty big city, <laughs> but anyway, I fell in love with a smoothie. I got there. I don't know if you called it a smoothie, but it was a uh, dates and uh, chocolate, cacao, and um, uh, what else did I put in it this morning? Of course, I put some salt, but I fell in love with this smoothie. I mean, and so whenever I make it, I like remember being at the farm stand and remembering the cafe because it made me happy. And you had your cute little Redmond salt things on all the tables. It was just a gorgeous place. I loved it. Anyway, I'm making this this morning, getting back to my kale. Believe it or not, this all relates. <laughs> and I added a teaspoon of my kale powder to my smoothie. First of all, anybody who goes ooh right away doesn't even, you can't even taste it. But the nutrition level is through the roof. It's more than a daily amount of vitamin C. It's more than so many other vitamins per day that I need in one little teaspoon of kale. So what I'm going to get back to is if I was worried about, oh, this kale I grew in my garden and I live in the granite state, there's a lot of granite in our soil. There's probably a lot of you know, um, heavy metals in my kale and man, maybe I shouldn't eat this kale. So I don't add it to my smoothie or maybe I skip the smoothie because it has dates and maybe the dates because they, where they grew, grew from dirt that had some, you know, you could very quickly just stop eating all this really good stuff because you listen to this one silly person that you're scrolling by on Instagram and you're going, Oh, maybe that's not good for me. <laughs> so we always have to step back and honestly just go, wait a minute. This is natural food. 100% from the earth, I'm pretty sure it's probably good for me. Now, in my sinful, ridiculous nature, I could probably warp it. I'm sure I could probably eat too much kale. That's probably possible. You know, my grandfather I definitely warped the idea of let's not have any salt and kill myself almost. <laughs> so we definitely can go overboard. But if it's from the ground, if you've grown it in your garden, I'm I'm 100% sure you don't have to worry that there's something in this that's bad for me. <laughs> like, you don't. <laughs> I want to pause this episode and ask if you are ready for the holidays. They are quickly approaching and it's time to think about if you can be a little more intentional this holiday season. I know it's my goal to be more intentional than I typically am hoping that the holidays don't just fly by without me really giving good thought to some things that are important to me, specifically gift giving. I don't want to give frivolous things that just provide something for the recipient to open. I want to give intentional gifts, ones that are promoting health and wellness, ones that are encouraging, fulfilling hobbies and activities, ones that are getting the family together and ones that are, of course, focused on healthy, real food. So if you'd like to see what I'm giving as gifts this year, I would love to share the guide with you. Go to solely rested, S-O-U-L-Y rested.com slash holiday. And I'm going to share with you some of my unusual, but I think gifts that will be very appreciated this year. Please go check it out. Solely rested.com slash holiday. I mean, the one caveat might be if you're right next to a power plant and it's been refining, mm. you know, stuff for decades. I mean, Good point. yes, there are things that we should be aware of as consumers, but to avoid eating natural food from a beautiful organic source because it's from the earth and the earth has trace amounts of metals. You know, fortunately, our bodies 
since the dawn of time have been able to process these. And so, yeah. yes, we don't want to, you know, come across as saying, hey, you know, toxicity is not a thing because it is. And we certainly want to be aware of that. But at the same time, natural foods will have trace amounts of the elements of the earth. And fortunately, our bodies can process those. And so we just need to be aware of that it's there and do that our best to minimize our exposure to, to toxic things in our environment. But to avoid kale or avoid spinach or avoid natural salt, because there's a trace amount in there and opt for a processed yeah. factory made kale, that in my opinion, doesn't make sense. And I would rather eat no. natural kale from your garden than one that's processed in a lab, even if the parts per million or parts per billion of, of lead is different because it's such a small amount and our bodies do have the ability to process that in those trace amounts. Absolutely. And in the end, you know, I think we all know, we're all smart, that in the end it all comes back to money. And if somebody's telling you otherwise that you're, you know, that maybe you should buy this box of whatever because it's going to be better for you than <laughs> what you grow in your garden, they're probably making money when you buy that box of whatever it is. So, or maybe, yeah, I'll stop there. I could go on, but <laughs> okay. So the third one is a big thing that when I talk to my followers on Instagram and I mention how much I love Redmond, it's not unlikely that I'm going to have somebody say, but I've heard it doesn't have iodine. So I know that this third myth I want you to bust for us is something that crosses people's minds a lot. And people believe that you're better off using refined table salt because our government has added the iodine, has required that those companies add the iodine, and we need that in our bodies. So I love that myth. And uh, and there's it's kind of a twofold myth because, in fact, even though our shaker says this salt does not supply iodine, a necessary nutrient. If we sent this to the lab and they did an elemental scan, they're also going to see that it contains natural iodine in it. About 10% of your recommended daily allowance is in each quarter teaspoon of natural salt, which makes sense because if we think about where the foods richest in iodine come from, they're typically our sea vegetables. And so the oceans do have iodine in them. And that's why kelp and seaweed and dulse also have iodine. So the short version of the iodine myth and the reason that iodine is added to almost every salt on the shelf that's processed is because of World War I. And in World War I, the draft was started and the military noticed that men, particularly out of the Midwest, had a goiter issue, which is an iodine deficiency. And you can't draft people to the military if they have goiter. And so the military with the government sat down and said, what can we do to get people to eat more iodine? Um, they talked about adding it to a water supply, like some municipalities do to force fluoride onto the population. Um, it didn't really work when you add it to water. There was discussion of adding it to flour because people are eating a lot of flour out of bags and processed flour. It doesn't work when you add iodine to flour. And so they came up with salt. They said, everybody has to eat salt. And so if we force salt manufacturers to add iodine to salt, then we'll force people to eat more iodine. And they could have had a campaign, hey, let's eat more iodine, but they didn't. They <laughs> made a law that said if salt manufacturers don't add iodine to salt, you have to put a warning that says this salt does not supply iodide, a necessary nutrient. Now, they're absolutely right in the necessary nutrient part because iodine plays such a key role in health, in women's health, particularly in reproductive health, but also in men's health. In both men and women, they find that in benign tumors, there's 53% of the normal iodine levels. And in malignant mm. tumors, it's less than 3% of the normal mm. iodine in tumors. So iodine is essential for thyroid function, for all kinds of body regulation. But there's been studies now that show that the iodine added to iodized salt is less than 10% bioavailable. Now, yeah. less than 10% is still something. And so if my only source in the world for iodine was iodized salt, knowing that it's less than 10% bioavailable, but knowing how important it is, 
I would use iodized salt to get my iodine if that was the only possible choice. Not a great choice. I know that it's not super bioavailable. I know it creates other challenges with salt because some of the other additives in your processed salt are there because they're adding iodine to it. And so you look at look at a, a shaker of salt with its iodized. There's a whole list of other chemicals and ingredients in there besides just potassium iodide. Um, yeah. But that's better than nothing. Um, now, the reason that iodine is so important and why we're having some of the challenges we have with iodine today, and we talked a little bit about this before the show, is our thyroids, they love halogens. Now, if you remember the periodic table of elements from grade school, we had our, our noble gases and our heavy metals and our um, alkaloids. And there's a little section right in the middle of the halogens. And they're listed on the periodic table of elements from the, the little stuff on top to the big, actually, I, I'm crossing that out the other way around. It's actually on the periodic table of elements. It's from the biggest to the smallest. So okay. you have... I wouldn't have known because I hated nope. chemistry, Daryl. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's ahead. actually, I'm just looking, I'm trying to think of the order as yeah. coming down the halogens, but it's actually, it is the, the smallest to the biggest uh, coming okay. down uh, by atomic weight. Now, if you think of the, the thyroid, like a big magnet, and if we had a big jar of marbles, and in this jar of marbles, we had uh, little steel ones and great big steel ones. And as we put that magnet in and we start swishing it around, those little steel balls are going to displace the big ones because they're going to squeeze in and push the big ones out. And so yeah. the thyroid kind of works the same way. The thyroid loves halogens. So if you lived next to a, a nuclear facility and there was a meltdown and there was radioactive iodine released, everybody within a certain mileage of that power plant will actually have iodine tablets. And if they don't, they will tell them to eat iodized salt because what they're wanting to do is to saturate the thyroid with good iodine so it can't absorb radioactive iodine because the thyroid mm -hmm. loves to absorb halogens which means that any of those other halogens in that group, because they're all smaller than chloride, they're going to fill up the space on the thyroid and block the reception of, of the iodine. So what are those other halogens we have to worry about? Well, if we looked at that periodic table of elements, it's bromine, which is the new car smell, or bromided flour or enriched flour. They'll actually enrich it with bromide. So bromide will displace chlorine or chloride, sorry, iodine. Um, and the next one down is fluoride and then chlorine mm -hmm. and then iodine. So chlorine, bromine, and fluorine or fluoride will all displace iodine because they're all halogens. And so not only do we need to seek out good sources of, of iodine in our diet, which would be sea vegetables, kelp, seaweed, fish, Mm -hmm. Um, uh, navy beans dairy. actually have a right. dairy. Yep. Uh, potatoes, particularly mm -hmm. potato skins have good sources of iodine and there's some good supplements mm -hmm. with iodine. Iodrol and Lugol's iodine solution. Mm -hmm. Those are all great sources of iodine. And most people, unless you're eating and seeking out fish and seaweed, you probably aren't getting enough iodine in your diet. But iodized salt is a poor solution to get that. Yeah. Um, and even though there's Especially trace with amounts, only 10% of that iodine mattering to your body because your body can't take it in. It's not bioavailable. Yeah. Correct. And so there's a lot of great sources for iodine. Natural salt is a source of iodine. It's not a high source. It's not a dietary amount. But you'll get mm -hmm. trace amounts of iodine from salt, but you'll get a lot more from natural kelp, seaweed, dulse, seafood, cranberries, navy beans, or iodine supplements that are going to be way better for you than trying to get this processed iodized salt that not only has been highly processed and demineralized, but the iodine that's added is, like I mentioned before, less than 10% bioavailable. Yeah. Um, many years ago, I bought a grain mill and I started converting our family over from enriched flour to fresh flour. And 
I love really going into the details and thinking about how much better it is for us. It's literally all three parts of the brand and it's, and the, the wheat berry, it's not any of those additives that you're going to find in your enriched flour. But what I don't know, and, and you, maybe you don't either, and that's fine. I'm just curious. Why is bromide added to flour when they enrich it? Do you know? Yeah. So it's a, it's a dough enhancer. Um, and oh. so it gives you, when you're making bread, um, it's a, it's an enhancer for the dough. And I'm not exactly sure what it does, um, but that's okay. why it's there is as a dough enhancer. But as you pointed so, out, you know, growing up, we always ground our own wheat and I love my mom's wheat bread way better than even the wheat bread at the store. Um, mm. And it doesn't need any enhancing. And so I don't know if, if yeah. because they strip the germ and, or the, the husk and all that other stuff, they put the bromide in to try to fix something that they broke when they took all this stuff out. Um, right. But right. I do know that's why it's added is as a dough enhancer. Okay. Uh, for, I got to say, you just were a way cool kid. Like your mom was this greeny, awesome lady milling her flour and you were out there riding on your sand or salt dunes, I should say. <laughs> uh, My mom was I before say- her time. She, uh, everybody yeah. kind of called her the witch doctor. <laughs> she had, you know, she had her herbal. The mill must have been like three feet high too, right? Was it this <laughs> giant contraption that she had? <laughs> well, she would, you know, we had comfrey plants and, you know, we had all kinds of, of herbs and she would, um, make our little capsules and, you know, blue cohosh capsules. Love it. And so, yeah, I love she, it. She Meanwhile, I'm over there eating my wonder bread and taking my <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> medicines instead of knowing how to make my own. And your mom was way doing all this cool stuff. I love it. Um, Oh, I just forgot what I was going to say. There's something about the the grain mill, I think. But anyway, <laughs> um, you know, it all just comes back around that, okay, the potato, it might have a heavy metal because it's naturally in the ground, but the skin of the potato is really high and good in, I already forget what you just told us. You said especially iodine. the skin of the potato. Iodine. Yeah. Duh, Michelle. <laughs> so, I mean... Just go natural. We just need to eat less refined and more natural foods, including where we're getting our salt from. It just makes sense. And as our bodies are healthy, you know, we believe at Redma that nature has it right with products. And we would much rather go back to the source um, like our grand, you know, early grandparents, you know, did and, right. and eat, you know, natural foods, clean foods. And yes, even though, you know, a, a potato or natural salt or kale chips are going to have trace amounts of the metals from the earth. Our bodies have always been able to process a background amount of those. And so it's just keeping that in mind and in check. And yes, drinking good, clean water, good, clean salt, good, clean food. Um, And fortunately, because we live on the planet earth, our bodies can, can process some trace amounts of those that I would rather have in a natural version than in a manufactured lab, highly processed version to, to process something and then introduce a whole lot of other challenges like iodized salt is a good example. You know, we take salt from the ocean, it's natural, it's clean, um, provided that it's not around Exxon Valdez or the BP oil spill or <laughs> yeah, but we take yeah. good, clean salt and we leave it the way nature intended. We don't strip the minerals out. We don't add chemicals back in. And I would much rather, you know, have oranges and citrus from a tree instead of out of a pill bottle. Um, nothing wrong with, you know, supplements when we need them, but I would much rather eat sea vegetables rich in iodine, even though there's, you know, some trace amounts of uh, heavy metals in the sea vegetables, as opposed to a highly processed, refined version of iodine. Yeah. Added to salt. (laughs) Yeah, totally. And actually, I just thought of what I was going to say, thinking about your mom's bread still, because kudos to you. You said that it was more tasty and your favorite. And that, I think that might go back to it's kind of what you grew up on and it's what you were familiar with, because I would argue most times I've talked about this on the show a good bit. When you start going over to natural instead of all the processed stuff, it doesn't taste as good. They do a lot of stuff to the processed food to make us crave it, to make us have to eat more. And to make it taste really, really good sometimes. So 
kudos to you that you at, as a kid even knew and preferred the better stuff because in general, I will be the first to admit and I'll tell my family, I can't hide it from them because they're eating it and they know, like, I know it doesn't necessarily taste as good, but it's so much better for us. And then once you get used to it, like I said, I'm six years down the road now with the fresh flour. I've gotten to the point that yes, I do prefer it in everything, but my bread doesn't rise as great. And the things I make sometimes are not, you know, as as chewy or whatever. And, you know, you play with your different wheat berries and try different things to improve it. But it's a it's a long game thing to get back to what our food used to be. It's a long game and it takes some learning for sure. But and salt. There's, go ahead. Well, there's some, as you said, there's some subtle things. You know, if you've never eaten a tomato, um, you know, the first time you switch over and you're used to, you know, command, canned or processed tomato juice and you get a, mm -hmm. a, your own tomato, yeah, it's going to be weird or different. But over time, when you go to the grocery store and you buy a tomato or you raise one in your backyard, then you really notice the difference because all yeah. tomatoes aren't equal. And if you harvest one outside a season or that's been processed, not mm -hmm. processed, but, you know, just kind of mass produced versus one that's uh, vine ripened in your backyard, mm -hmm. then the flavor is really noticeable between yeah. something like And the difference, honestly, the difference in what you're talking about there is the soil. I've been talking a lot with my followers on Instagram about soil recently. And if your soil doesn't have the nutrients because it's being commercially raised, those tomatoes, and they have depleted their soil over the years of any good minerals and they're struggling with, you know, that, then the tomato is not going to taste as good and it's not going to be as high in nutrients. But, but I was going to say with salt, honestly, it's really cool that you can switch over from that one that has the little girl holding the umbrella and switch over to the Redmond Real Salt. And not only is it no worse per se, it's tastier. It's a little sweeter. It's actually better. So I'm good news, guys. There are some natural things you can switch over to and actually taste as good or better. So that's a good thing. And I love it. I'm going to end with this. I think that I love it. I want to say thank you that your company has chosen to leave the minerals in there. Because so many of the salt companies have chosen to take them out. And again, it comes down to that bottom line. There's more money to be made if they take out those minerals and they sell each of them on the market for all different products that can be made with them. And then they're giving the consumer the bare salt with no minerals in it, none of that good stuff from the earth. So thank you that there is someone like your family who is still doing it the right way. And I greatly appreciate it personally. Well, Michelle, it's it's been a real pleasure. I um, appreciate you having me on again today. And um, yeah, we at Redmond, we believe that nature had it right with products. And so we try to leave our family of products just as clean as as nature created them. Um, and we really appreciate all that you do to help educate on the importance of, of getting back to natural and making your own you know, wheat uh, flour and grinding it yourself and worrying about the soils and taking care of the the planet that we live on as, uh, as good stewards of, of our communities. Absolutely. I'm still learning, but I like to share what I learned. So <laughs> thank you so much, Daryl. This has, as always, been a great pleasure. Thanks, Michelle. Have a great day. You too. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. And I also want to remind you that if you go to solely rested, S-O-U-L-Y rested.com slash salt, I have some more information there about Daryl's family-run business, and I also have linked nine of my absolute favorite products that I get from Redmond that are always in my kitchen. Go to solelyrested.com slash salt. And also, you know what? I'm going to tell you one more thing. I, I didn't even bring it up with Daryl because I know his response. We've had this conversation before. He is very humble and very straightforward and very honest. And I know that there are other good salt options out there. And people will sometimes ask me, well, how have I chosen this one? Because they love X, Y, or Z, which are also unrefined natural options. And I explained to them, you know what? There's a lot of really, there's a lot of good salt options that don't have the added iodine, that don't have the added chemicals that you don't need, that don't have um, the non-caking agents that you don't need that are all just straight from nature. But here's the thing. Basically, when you narrow it down, you have a Celtic sea salt option, you have Himalayan salt option, and you have Redmond real salt. And here's my own personal thoughts 
about why I would always choose Redmond. If you look at Celtic sea salt, while it is a good option, while it does have the added minerals, unfortunately, it's harvested from the oceans. And there's no way of getting around it. The oceans are polluted, sadly. And there's just no way to avoid that. But with Redmond real salt, it is from an ancient seabed and it's underground. It has never been exposed to pollutants. So that, in my mind, makes a big difference in the quality of the salt that I'm eating. And then if you look at the Himalayan salt, it unfortunately is traveling a really long distance to get to us. I always am wanting to shop locally when I can and stay close when I can. Utah is not close to New Hampshire, but it's a whole lot closer than the Himalayans, and it's here in the U.S. On top of that, I have some firsthand knowledge of Redmond and their company, their business, the way they run it. I've talked to many of their employees. It's a solid, great company that really treats their employees well, and they have a really good working environment. Can't say that about Himalayan salt. So I'm just going to leave that at that. But those are the main reasons, aside from how delicious the salt is. It has a slightly sweet taste, Redmond Real Salt, how gorgeous it is with all the minerals you can see in your bowl of salt. And it's a great price and it's, a, it's just a great quality and a great company. So that's why I have chosen this option. And I just wanted to share that with you because I know. Um, Daryl wouldn't have told you, well, we have the best and this is why. He very humbly would have explained that, yes, there are other good options. <laughs> so anyway, go to solelyrested.com slash salt. Seriously, let me know what you think about my favorite nine items there. And please take advantage of that great discount code as well. So that's it for today, guys. And I want to say thanks for listening. Remember, it is easy to forget how blessed we are to live this life. So enjoy the simple, everyday efforts. It's not easy, but it's a good life.